welcome, welcome everyone. I'm Rivka Rivera. I am the Associate Director of the Florence Belsky Charitable Foundation. The Flobel Foundation specializes in intergenerational mentoring. We have over 1,500 intergenerational global advisors in all sectors. And this webinar is part of our new endeavor, the Flobel Academy, which will offer intergenerational online classes for adults in transitional periods, careers, changes, retirement, et cetera, and for everyone. So let's get to it. We have an amazing panel tonight. I will start with our panelist, Samson Williams. Samson Williams is joining us from Washington, D.C., where he plays his trade as a classically trained anthropologist who also specializes in crisis management for banks, financial institutions, and the odds government agency. When not in D.C., Samson can be found traveling around Europe and the Middle East, lecturing on fintech, space economics, and how technology transforms social capital into financial capital. Samson is an adjunct professor at Columbia University in New York City and University of New Hampshire School of Law, where he lectures on AI, ethics, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and the space economy. In his spare time, Samson is president of the Crowdfunding Professional Association and investor and head cheerleader for GoingPublic.com and SEC-regulated Reg A Plus investment crowdfunding platform crowdfunding platform. We also have filmmaker Meryl Branch McTiernan. Meryl Branch McTiernan is a native New Yorker who travels between Hollywood and Lower East Side of Manhattan. She's currently producing her first feature film, The Dropout, which she co-wrote with Terrell Schaffner, who will direct. The script placed in the top 5% of the Academy's nickel competition in 2019 and 2020. She's an adjunct professor of television writing at Stony Brook University, where she's completing her master's degree in creative writing and literature. Her fiction has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail and the podcast Nobody Reads Short Stories. Her nonfiction writing has appeared in the Huffington Post. Her pilots, feature, and spec scripts have placed in screenwriting competitions such as the Beverly Hills Film Festival, Final Drafts Big Break Competition, the second round at the Austin Film Festival, and the second round of the Sundance Institute's Episodic Story Lab and Sundance Feature Film Lab. Stephen Beer will be moderating this amazing panel. Stephen Beer is a partner in the New York office of Louis Brisbois and a national chair of the firm's entertainment, media, and sports practice. Stephen concentrates his practice on film, television, and music matters, where he represents industry-leading film, television, and music companies, and has acted as counsel to numerous award-winning writers, directors, producers, and multi-platinum musical artists. Stephen has been listed annually in Super Lawyers New York Metro Edition. Research and markets listed him as one of the top lawyers in entertainment law settlements and negotiations. The Rap Online Magazine cited Stephen as one of 21 great thinkers of indie film. Stephen co-authors the legal FAQ column for Documentary Magazine, published by the International Documentary Association and several other notable publications. Stephen serves as a trustee to the City Parks Foundation and is co-chair of the Arts Committee responsible for Summer Stage, New York City's largest free performing arts festival. He's also a Rooftop Films board member and plays ice hockey in his spare time. Stephen has also been a moderator of many of these wonderful webinars, which you can find on our YouTube channel. Stephen, I'm going to hand this panel over to you. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for that kind introduction, Rivka. I was saying beforehand how much I enjoy moderating these panels because I get to meet industry experts. I get to learn from them. And uh, I'm really excited about today to spend a lot of time as an attorney counseling producers, investors, filmmakers in um, independent film. And among the most challenging things has been uh, traditionally raising money for independent film. So crowdfunding and learning about crowdfunding has been a great innovation over the last 10 years. More recently, crowdfunding has taken heightened interest with amendments to the securities laws for crowdfunding, where producers can now raise equity with, uh, with uh, crowdfunding as an exception to the securities laws. We're gonna get into some of that. I just wanted to um, say what an honor it is to, to be speaking with Merrill because Merrill, you've done quite well with your, um, with your crowdfunding campaign which uh, for the dropout, which is ongoing, you've raised $170,000, over 100, 169 
investors, I thought it might be a, a good way for it to get us going by talking a little bit about your campaign, starting with the genesis of your crowdfunding campaign. What, what was the idea? How did you come across uh, crowdfunding? And are you going for, um, for a rewards-based crowdfunding campaign? Or are you seeking equity only? Or is it a hybrid? Um, hi, Stephen. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so the first question is how we uh, came to, we, we're doing it on WeFunder. Um, and um, it started, uh, my writing partner and I have been working on this for six years. And uh, for the first, after we felt, felt that the script was good, which was probably about two years in, uh, we started looking for producers. We went to Sundance uh, multiple times, met people there, tried to get someone who would kind of take a chance on us when we had no money. Um, and uh, we, we weren't successful in doing that. Um, but then one of our friends uh, in, I guess, early uh, 2020 decided to start do a WeFunder campaign and they raised 150,000, which was their whole bu budget. Their movie actually just became available today. Um, so that's exciting. Um, and so based on their experience with actually attracting people outside of their circle, um, which we, we knew that we couldn't raise all the money with just people we knew. Um, so we thought it would be good for us. And um, we started, we, the campaign opened in May. I think we started kind of talking with them at late last year. Um, and so we've raised this money in six months. And it's, uh, it's equity only. Excellent, thank you. Samson, tell us a little bit about um, how you've come to the crowdfunding community. I understand you're president of the Crowdfunding Association. Tell us a little bit about that too. Uh, yeah, and so in 2016, when the Jobs Act got signed uh, into law, so it got passed in 2012, it got signed into law in 2016 by President Obama. That enabled retail investors, also known as customers, to be able to invest in the businesses that they were already customers of. So at the time I was at Fannie Mae, uh, doing evil finance stuff. And I left them to go join a real estate crowdfunding uh, platform specifically because in the what's called the reggae plus world, um, they've been syndicating uh, opportunities in real estate via crowdfunding since 2012. So this is how I got my introduction into regulation crowdfunding. And I want to give a couple of disclaimers. Number one, I'm not a lawyer. I'm only a lawyer on Twitter, so don't ask me any legal questions. Number two, none of this is, could, should be construed as legal advice whatsoever. Um, so if you want legal advice, ask Stephen. And the, the next thing is, if you're looking at raising money for your business, I don't care if it's a movie or a taco shop, if you have to pitch, you might as well pitch to everyone. So using crowdfunding, specifically Reg CF, you can raise up to $5 million dollars for your movie, your taco shop, your SAF, your software company, your SaaS company, whatever it happens to be. But there is a process where now that you know you can go to your customers and engage them as potential investors, there is a process that you have to go to where typically it's beneficial to get a lawyer like Steven to help walk you through that process. But again, you can now actually ask the people, your customers who make your businesses make your films successful to be your actual investors. And that really changes the dynamics of the investing games for the startups, for the producers, for the founders. Based on your experience, Samson, can you tell us a few of the, of the difference makers as to what constitutes a, a successful campaign? What are, the, what are the things that you're seeing in terms of best practices that can lead to successful results? So, Raising money for your start for your film or your startup is very similar to selling your house. You can't just you got to do you got to put a little bit of legwork to get ready. So my favorite example is Usain Bolt. You see him run for ten seconds, but he spent an entire lifetime. He spent thirty years getting to that ten seconds. So number one, if you hear that, hey, so and so raised two million, five million dollars in eight hours, which is happening on a regular basis. Just realize they put in the work to get their deal organized and to engage their community. So first step is you got to be ready to engage your community. If you don't have a community, you need to start to build it because it doesn't matter if you're going to um, VCs, angels, or the crowd, each of your potential investors, they need to know this 
pretty much the same data sets, the same bit of information in order to make a decision to invest. So number one, engage your community. Number two, come up with a term sheet that whether you're a shark, an angel, or a retail investor, you find attractive. Those are the two most important things universally we see. Because uh, the hardest part about raising money, it, it does cost funds to raise money. And most of that is spent on marketing, particularly if you haven't already engaged your community. All right, let's talk about the community. You have to have a community to engage, as you said. What, what are the steps that, uh, that campaigners, that crowdfund campaigners ought to be making in terms of developing an audience? Because not everyone wakes up and they have tens of thousands of people that they can speak to. How does one begin to, to develop, to build an audience? So I'm going to give you two and I'm going to pitch to, to Meryl because she was doing it. She's like, I went, to this con- I went to this conference. I went to Sundance. She's taking hands, kissing babies, getting people to know who she's, she is. And part of that is the number one thing that any founder needs to overcome is stranger danger. Who are you? Why are you here? Otherwise, why would a rational person give up their hard-earned money to support your dream? So you have to overcome that stranger danger. One of the ways you can overcome that stranger danger is becoming is by becoming a known subject matter expert in whatever your field happens to be. So if you're a producer, well, then you should market yourself as a producer, get known in your industry as a producer, because that way, when you say, hey, I have a film, people are like, oh, I know Merle. She's great. She produced this last movie. Then, it, then stranger danger, there's no bar to that. It's 100 percent. They're very happy to see you. They're super excited about your next uh, project. And so that's one of the ways that you can increase your odds of successfully funding. It does cost sweat equity, time and effort for you to become well-known or become a known entity within your industry, but you should be doing that anyhow. So I'm going to ask Merrill, what are one of the other techniques you use to build your community during your uh, fundraise? Wait, don't say during. Sounds to me, if I'm hearing you correctly, that like a booster to a rocket, a lot of this needs to happen before the campaign. You, you need to develop an audience before the campaign begins. Meryl, would you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, so we've had an Instagram account for this movie <laughs> for like three years and we didn't have any actors. We didn't have anything. It's just me posting random things to try to get people engaged. And we were able to get 500 followers before we even started the campaign. Um, posting regularly on social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. Um, Definitely the conference thing, taking lots of uh, business cards and stuff. We went to Austin and Sundance. Um, One of our producers came from someone we met at the bar at Austin. We only met her once and she gave us a significant amount of money. Um, Yeah, just taking every opportunity you can to talk about your project. Uh, and I do want to be very clear because, Stephen, you might already about to say this. You can't say you're raising money and before you filed all your appropriate paperwork. Mm-hmm. You can build your community, but just don't say, hey, we're going to raise money in 2025. You need to be specific that you're building your community to support your product, your film, not specifically for the purpose of raising money before all your paperwork is filed. And Stephen will probably follow up and tell oh. you where that is. Well, of course, Samson, I, I appreciate your, your raising this. It, it, it must be emphasized that raising money, seeking investors to finance a film is a security and there are securities laws. And if you disregard or ignore securities laws, you do so at your own risk and peril. The good news is that there are exemptions and uh, to the securities law and Reg CF is a prime example of that. But you need to be familiar with it. You need to be knowledgeable about it because it is, uh, it, it is all too easy for an investor who had a bad experience to go back over the representations that the producer made to ruin the producer's career and good name. So please, please be careful, seek counsel. This is, this is complicated, but not so complicated that you can't understand that there are rules of the road. 
one of the benefits of the innovation of the crowdfunding community is the emergence of entities that have been pretty good at helping to break down the parameters of securities laws and help producers navigate through that. Um, I wonder, Meryl, you mentioned that you were working with one of those entities now. Can you discuss a little bit about, um, about that? Which one are you working with and what have they done to help in the securities department or at least to break down some of the, some of the, uh, the obstacles or challenges that, uh, that you need to understand before you start soliciting funds? Um, so yeah, so we're working with WeFunder um, and we had to fill out a ton of paperwork in order to be accepted onto their website. Um, and we had we also hi- had hired a lawyer before starting that so that we'd have our lawyer read over everything and explain what we were signing. And, and when we set up our contract, to make sure that we could have certain things like, like right now, uh, an investor coming from outside of the platform so that we'd be able to take money from them as well. So we just wanted to make, uh, between between WeFunder and our own lawyers, we were able to set ourselves up to not break any laws, I hope. I, I, I'm just looking at your, uh, your offering here on WeFunder for the dropout. And I just want to point out a couple of things to people who are considering this. Number one, you, you do have to be a bona fide business to do this. Sometimes people just get very excited, but you do need to be a bona fide business. But right now, there are about 64 FINRA financial regulatory approved portals. So you can pick one of any of the 64, just looking at Merrill's uh, offering here on WeFunder. You do need to make the terms attractive to the investor. So her terms are 120% of the principal plus 50% of net profit share. And then they explain that 100% of proceeds are paid to investors pro rata until they hit 120% of principal in investment is returned. Thereafter, investors earn 50% of net profit shares. There's some more details, but when your investors see this, they want to know, oh, I have the potential to, uh, have to benefit, but you also have to give them the disclosures and the risk. So it's very important that as you go to uh, launch your own crowdfunding campaign, Find someone else's, like the graduates here from Merle, and look at it, look at her crowdfunding offering so you can see some of the particulars. And I also want to point out and reiterate that for Reg CF, you can raise up to $5 million, but often you don't have, you, you might not need all $5 million. In this instance, to get the show on the road, she was able to raise $169,785. Bucks from 169 investors. So that she's starting to, she's built her audience. She's built her investors. An investor is a customer who is now an investor. And so as she moves forward with the production of this film, she has 169 fans who are incentivized to share her film, to talk to other people in the industry, to open up doors that she personally can't do by herself. So when you go to do your own campaign, check out WeFunder, The Dropout, see how she did it. Because you might need $169,000, you might need a little bit more, but Mara will tell you it all goes back to building that initial community to get people engaged in your vision. So the SEC amended the securities laws, uh, Reg CF, back in March 2020. It used to be a million dollars could be raised over a 12-month period. And it doesn't, that million-dollar threshold was raised to $5 million as Samson mentioned a little while ago, it doesn't have to be limited to one film. Uh, it's just, it just to, the, uh, to the issuer or the production company. And you don't have to rely exclusively on the crowdfunding as a means to raising money for your film. You can, you can still take advantage of production incentives or, or loans. Uh, so it's part of a part of a package, but it seems, seems to me that when you have these organizations like, uh, like WeFunder, that there, there is um, a wilderness guide today that didn't exist years ago for organizations that can really hold your hand step by step and give you guidance as to best practices. Another amendment, I just want to, to uh, raise, um, raise this point too, back in March, 2020, the SEC also increased the limits for 
accredited and unaccredited investors. Um, there's actually there's no limit for accredited investors, and we can discuss um, the definition of accredited investor is where um, either net worth in excess of a, a million dollars, or alone or together with a spouse, um, excluding the value of your primary residence, or two gross income in excess of two hundred thousand dollars in each of the two most recent tax years, or or if it's a, a joint income tax return with a spouse or a partner in excess of $300,000. So understand that there is an important distinction between uh, accredited and unaccredited investors. And back in March 2020, the SEC was able to increase the uh the limit for um, unaccredited investors. The SEC increased the limit from approximately twenty five hundred dollars to around yes. five thousand dollars for retail yes. investors. Yeah, um, that is. Yeah, that's right. There's a sliding scale for that in the portals themselves. They will have it when you go to log in. They will tell you after you put in some information what your ability, how much you can in invest. If you're an accredited investor and you get a letter from your CPA that says that you make more than $200,000 uh, as an individual or $300,000 as a couple, then you, you don't have a restriction on the amount of funds you can invest into a given deal. And so I want to want to keep this in mind because Merrill, maybe um, when you get a lot of investors in at small amounts, because most of these people, they're investing 100, 250, 500 bucks, um, you, you attract larger investors. The quote unquote accredited investors are the whales. Meryl, if you can share it, have you seen that happen with your crowdfunding campaign? If you can talk about it. Definitely. Um, so we, we raised our first like 68,000 from friends and family, um, which were a lot of smaller investments. So by the time we ended our, because they allow you to do two weeks of, you know, like a soft land launch with just friends and family. So by the time you go, you're open to the wider community of the WeFunder community, we already had this money and we could show that we had a certain amount of investors. And so that I think made us more attractive. And then our last few investments have been, you know, 10,000 to 25,000 from people that we haven't been reaching out they, who have found us. And I think we're impressed by the number of people we had. Mm -hmm. So I located the uh, accredited, for non-accredited investor, the amendment for non-accredited investors, if the investor's annual income or net worth is less than $107,000, then the investment limit is the greater of $2,200 or 5% of the annual income or net worth. If the non-accredited accredited investor's annual income or net worth are both equal to or more than 107,000, then the limit is 10% of the greater of their annual income or net worth, not to exceed $107,000. So these amendments work to make equity crowdfunding even more an even more attractive um, option. And that's as of, of last year. 100%. And if you're an investor, don't worry the platforms will do these calculations for you. So you, you, they'll keep you in compliance. Also, we should mention that if you're an investor, there's what's called KYC and AML. This is also important for Cheryl as the founder, as a producer. Uh, KYC is know your customer check and AML is anti-money laundering. It's to prevent illicit funds being used uh, to what, regardless of what your business is, whether again, you're a taco shop or a film, because that's really a, a protection for Meryl, because she doesn't want to, you know, raise her hundred and seven seventy thousand dollars, and then come to find out it's being her her film is being used for nefarious purposes. Uh, Meryl, I did have a question for you because I was looking at the breakdown of your use of funds. Can you share with the audience and someone who's considering raising money for a film why is that use of funds breakdown so important? Um, why is it so important? Well, I mean to know what you really need to raise, do you know what's possible if at a certain level, um, like we wouldn't be, we had to figure out what's really the lowest amount of money that we could do this for and be able to pay the actors and be able to get locations. Um, so it's good to figure all that stuff out before you start asking for money. And it's also helpful when you speak with investors 
you know, when they say, what is this for? And what do you need like to be able to answer those questions? hundred percent, hundred percent. And I have one more question for you before I turn it over back to Steven. Yeah. Uh, I see that you have a perk system, but since your offering has closed, uh, I can't see what the perk system is. Can you describe a little bit or tell some details about your perk system? Oh yeah. So we did an early bird uh, perk, which was 5% more. So they were getting 125 versus 120%. Uh, um, and it, it ended up going to like all friends and family because they were the first people, first money in. Mm-hmm. That's really good. So um, if you're looking to organize your friends and family round, uh, crowdfunding is a great vehicle for that. Because Meryl, I think you said you raised $68,000 from your friends and family. Uh, And what this does is it enables your friends and family to go to a platform, see who's on the cap table, see who's invested what. There's no backroom or sidebar deals. It's very transparent. So that's another benefit that you get from using uh, a FINRA licensed funding portal. And of course, engaging a lawyer to help you through that process. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing with WeFunder is that they have a, they have a database of like anyone who's ever invested and they have newsletters that go out. So once we hit 50,000 and a hundred thousand, they sent out emails to everyone who were able to find out about our campaign. So they did some of that work for us. So one of the fun things in flipping through the various campaigns is looking at the videos, which is a a key sales device. Uh, Meryl, I I took a look at your your video, your presentation for for the film, and and I thought that you did a nice job on it. What were some of the considerations that you you created for for, um, your video? Uh, Well, I have to give my my co-writer most of the credit for the video, um, but what... I guess we really wanted uh, people to connect to us and want to invest in us and our vision and and to invest in women um, and to just sort of give a feel of what the movie would feel like. Um, Because we spoke with other successful uh, campaigns, movie campaigns, and they said a lot of it was people liking them and feeling like they trusted them. So we just wanted to come off as authentic as possible. Um, and to to share our excitement about the movie. And I noticed that you, uh, for the dropout, that you had a certain hook for the film in terms of the, the presentation and the plot. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about about uh, uh, the hook and you know what's the dropout about? Um, sure. Uh, we say it's a modern retelling of the graduate from a female perspective, um, which it sort of is, um, but it's also sort of just the hook that gets people excited. Um, it was uh, it was actually inspired by an ex-boyfriend of mine who uh, did have an affair with his girlfriend's mother, not my mother, um, and, um, and a combination of the graduate um, that's sort of how we first thought about it. And, um, it, you know, people get excited because so many people love the graduate. So, and the, the dropout is the inverse of the graduate. I also noticed that you paid special attention in the video, uh, your, your partner uh, in her presentation talked about um, some of the, the interesting female characters and the, the, the plot twist versus the, the usual way that, that, um, uh, men are presented and how you're presenting women in this instance. Can you speak about that? Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, we kind of talk about women behaving badly to some extent, or can you, can you empathize with a woman who makes a mistake and risks everything for passion and, and love and sex? Um, and that's, that's been sort of uh, the driving force between us as we've worked on the script, we've been, that's sort of what we agreed on. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people feel that Mrs. Robinson was the most interesting part of uh, the graduate and they would like to see a little bit like, well, how did she get there? Um, And I think that that's sort of what people are doing more like with the, uh, the impeachment series going on right now, which focuses on the women uh, from, from the Clinton administration. And uh, I just think that there is a resurgence of people wanting to know the woman's side of the story um, and wanting to see women make mistakes. So Samson, I want to ask you how, what's in it for the platforms? How do they make money? 
Um, so the platforms make money off of the amount raised. So every platform fee is slightly different. Generally speaking, it's somewhere between 5% and 14%. Um, we funders probably somewhere in the 7 to 8% range. Uh, Meryl, I, I, I didn't check. Meryl, what's the fee that we funder charges? Seven and a half percent. <laughs> okay, excellent. So, um, which means out of that $170,000 that Merrill has raised, the platform charges seven and a half percent for that. Um, and this is standard across the industry where the platforms, they do by and large need to be neutral in presenting the offerings. They do have these email lists that Merrill mentioned, where if you if your campaign has hit a specific level, they can send out a email to their uh, email list, to their investor list, say, hey, here are the campaigns that have reached this level. They might not be able to do, they can't, they shouldn't be doing specific marketing for you. But as again, as you're part of that cohort who's hit this milestone, they can say, here are the businesses that have hit this milestone today. And so this is where the crowdfunding portals, they are licensed by FINRA, Financial Regulatory Authority. So if you've ever heard of someone with the Series 63 or, or such license, that comes from FINRA, they're able to charge a fee for only for your successful raise. One of the good things for investors, if for whatever reason the campaign doesn't hit uh, its minimum funding goal, let's say you set a minimum funding goal of $100,000 if it doesn't, if they only raise 90, all that money goes back to the people who, who would have been investors. So that's 100% clear. Meryl, do you want to add anything to that nuance? Yeah. I mean, like, as you said about knowing where the allocations and everything, like we had to know, like, all right, so if we get a certain amount, like, is that just going to be too low? We had to know what that number would be so that we could really make we could, yeah, it wouldn't, so that we would, that we would raise it. So we didn't want to go too high and then risk not raising it, but we didn't want to go too low and have to do it for a lower level. Yes. Cause so, yeah. oh, no, please good. continue. Oh, um, because it does cost your time, energy, your expertise. You got to make a video. You got to get your, it's called a form C. Uh, Stephen will probably tell you a little bit more about the form C. You have to get that completed. Typically, a lawyer will help you do that. There is some sunk cost in getting your campaign prepared. So if you don't hit your minimum raise, you've already, as a producer, as a filmmaker, you've already paid for that sunk cost, even though you're not going to hit your funding goal, which is why it's very important to do that community build up front to get your commitments lined up. Um, get your community engaged so that when your campaign does go live and you send out that link, you know, if you've got an early bird special, if it's for your friends or your family or your community, you want that filled as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Stephen, back to you. Uh, so what are, let's talk about some of the risks. There have been instances where producers did not always follow through with their obligations, their commitments to provide uh, to fulfill the rewards that were the, the incentives on which the uh, on which people gave money to a project. Similarly, there are instances where filmmakers uh, or producers did not always account for the monies uh, received, the revenues received under the project. So even though you're entitled to um, hypothetically 120% return, and a pro rata share of the of the investors pool. Um, if you're not getting reports, and, and then uh, what happens with the portal? Does the portal have any uh, bear any obligation to the investor if uh, in the event that the producer doesn't follow through with their commitment for incentives or financial return? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to answer this question. I, I didn't want to ignore Michael's question there in the chat. He said he found the perks that were offered. Did the perks start at 250? That's a question for Merrill. Yeah. So that's the minimum perk was 250. The, the minimum investment was $100, but you didn't get a perk until you hit 250. Do you recall what that perk was for 250? Uh, a shout out on social media. I'm not sure if there's anything beyond that. Okay. No, again, you, when you come up with your perk system, you just have to say, hey, if you invest a minimum of $250, we're going to shout you out on social media. If you invest, this is hypothetically right now, if you invest $500, we're 
you might get a t-shirt or you know front row seats at the premiere whatever your perk system is it's a way of to a degree it's gamifying investing because you're incentivizing people to invest at a certain level for an additional perk in addition to the securities that financial instrument um and then to add, answer your question about risk so one of the beautiful things about crowdfunding in the jobs act is that it's a requirement on the platform that you enable your community to talk to each other. And, and so part of it is if you're building a community uh, in Merrill's instance, she has 169 investors. If she raises $170,000 and then one of her community members says, I just saw Merrill drive away in a Mercedes AMG WTF. Now there's a little bit of accountability because she has 169 eyeballs who are saying, hey, what's the status of your film? I don't know anyone. No one's talking about it. I don't see any casting for it because many of these people are coming for your friends and family. Uh, the first $68,000 was from her friends and family. And so it's a way of, from a regulatory structure, the portal enables all of these individuals to talk to each other. So there's not only regulatory accountability, but also social accountability and a little bit of social pressure to keep this person honest. What you do have to do is annual reporting, meaning at the end of each year, you need to send your issue, your investors, what's called a K-1, that tells them what is the status of, the, of their investment. Did they make any money? Did you lose any money? Uh, Mayor, I'm not sure when your funding, when your campaign ended, you might not be at that juncture yet, but are you making any, how have you planned for keeping your uh, investors updated? Um, yeah, that's something we're still figuring out. We, we haven't, close the campaign yet so we don't have to deal with it yet but um i yeah whatever we have to do we'll we'll do excellent uh barbara i think we're we're talking we're, when you say what app was mentioned we're talking about uh merrill's oh, uh, campaign there on WeFunder. so that's that that is a platform not necessarily an app and so Re revka just dropped in where you can find that at um and I do want to point out there was an enforcement action by the SEC against a portal uh, called uh, True Crowd, T R U Crowd, um, where they named the portal the portal owner as well as the issuer. And you're called an issuer whenever you're raising money because you're issuing some kind of financial instrument. And excuse me, in that instance, the issuer they raised about one point eight million dollars, but for a cannabis business but then they were buying uh, Mercedes and other fancy cars and not using it for the business purpose. And so again, because you have to do annual reporting and because you probably have anywhere between uh, 100 to upwards of 30,000 people in your crowdfunding campaign, it does behoove you to act above boards. And of course, with all investing comes risk, meaning even if things go perfectly, you, there is still a chance of failure but you do have to, to the best of your ability, try to return to your investors what they initially invested. And so there's a number of safeguards where either the uh, SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, FINRA, Financial Regulatory Authority, will go to uh, keep everyone above board in addition to your crowd of investors. Samson, are there any tax considerations that investors should uh, should think about in making in uh, coming on board a campaign and contributing to a film project. Uh, it just works like any investment. You know, if your investment does well, that's a good problem. You should talk to your CPA and say, "Hey, this investment did well. I, I got X amount of I got everything over 120 percent." You know, went back to investors. So I benefited based upon my initial investment. I earned this much money. And that's a conversation you can have with your tax professional to help you. Again, that's a good problem if your investment has done well. On the flip side, if for any reason you've made an investment in any business and it is not done well, but you've gotten that K-1 back from the uh, film that says, hey, I understand it. You invested $1,000. We had a loss due to whatever reason. Now you'd use that as a deduction. So there's either way, there's benefits. And just remember, while there are upsides of investments, there are also potential downsides of investments. Never invest your mortgage, number one. Never invest more than what you can afford. And the platform itself, uh, Stephen, you read the requirements. 
if you're a retail investor versus an accredited investor, it does limit the amount of funds you can invest to, again, limit, limit you from exposure, from, from losing too much money. And Meryl, were there any perks that you offered that were particularly uh, motivating that people got especially excited about? Uh, well, one was the walk-on, actually. We have two of our <laughs> higher end uh, investors who are excited to do a walk-on. Um, and one wanted the script. Um, uh, I think that just having those numbers helped, you know, getting something at a certain level just made people grow to that level in general. And uh, is there a certain time of the year uh, that people suggest is, a, is the right time of the year or a better time of the year to launch a crowdfunding campaign? Uh, if you've been growing your community, whatever that, if you have a special date in your community, align it to that 110%. Generally speaking, and this is just for uh, 2020 as of October, uh, as for Q3 2020. So far, Reg CF, Regulation Crowdfunding, uh, it's raised 500 million this year. We've just gone over the 500 million mark. This is a very good number for an industry that is five years old. I might not have forgot, I forgot to mention this, that Reg CF, the ability to raise up to $5 million is, well, that ability is actually only from March of 2021, as Stephen pointed out earlier, as before the limit was a million. But now you can raise up to 5 million. Uh, Reg Title Three of the Jobs Act is only five years old. And so in our fifth year, the industry has been able to raise up to $500 million as of Q3. Um, that means there's 1,281 deals that have been funded. That comes out to approximately 17,000 jobs. And these are all Main Street jobs because when Meryl goes to shoot her, sh shoot her production, she's going to do it somewhere locally. And that's why I love being president of the Crowdfunding Professional Association. But more importantly, that means this year there's been over 468,000 new investors who have been putting their money where their mouth is investing in the community. So if you're looking to go engage a hyper-local audience, if you have a specific date you can tie that to, absolutely do it. Generally speaking, we've seen for the last five years, from October to December is crowdfunding season where most people make investments. We think it's because they're trying to wrap up uh, for tax purposes, for their investments, to figure, hey, I need to make some investments to help me help situate my taxes uh, for the year. Oh, that's a good consideration. The uh, end, end of the year. Now, uh, Meryl, what, um, what would you, what advice would you give someone considering a crowdfunding campaign? Would you, would you um, recommend that they go forth and pursue an, an equity campaign like, like you have? Yeah, I mean, I think the amount of money that you can raise in an equity campaign versus like um, versus the uh, like GoFundMe or Kickstarter, um, I think you can just get a lot more from that because people are not just donating, they're investing um, and that there's built in communities of people that you can tap into that you might not know in, um, in your everyday life. So I would definitely recommend it, but also be prepared to spend some money and a lot of time getting it set up. Are you um, raising, uh, how else are you financing the film? Is it just from the equity crowdfunding or are you uh, going out to get loans or you know, what, what else, is, what other um, activities are you doing to raise money for the film apart from equity crowdfunding, if any? So our plan was to do it completely through equity crowdfunding. Um, and we were, because we were promoting our campaign in different locations, such as LinkedIn, we actually got a random person who saw our campaign and reached out to us and wanted to make a bigger investment and to work outside of uh, WeFunder. So that, that will actually get us to our, to our, the upper limits of our budget. Um, so, but, you know, they would have never known of, about us had we not made that video and hadn't been promoting the fact that we were doing this. Mara, I see we have a question here from Michael. Did the $25,000 uh, EP credit include producer points? 
It does not. It's just just a EP credit. And so again, when you go to design your park system, that, you know, it's it's sort of the gamification. You some people might be interested in that, but if you're also pro giving producer points, that might impact your overall deal structure. In which case, Stephen, the lawyer that you retain, will give you some uh, context of whether that is an advisable thing to do. Right, like we wanted to use our producer points um, to to reward actors who are, you know, maybe we're not paying them what their normal rate would be, so give them some points, um, so to use them for other for other members of the crew. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back to what you just said, Merle, about you have your you've gone through the process, you filed your form C, your lawyer has worked out the compliance, you're talking about your deal, your in the past, if you went to a VC or angel, you're, you take your term sheet, they mark it up, you go back and forth, you waste a few weeks, and then they say it over, Ooh, tell us when someone else invests, right? And so you're like, ah, but using Reg CF, as you're talking about your deal, as you're marketing the opportunity for retail investors, for fans to invest in your uh, deal, it's where those larger sharks and whales, they can see like, what, like, what is the dropout doing? I don't understand why I keep hearing about this. Um, they can see the deal. So what you will see in many instances, whereas you'll have what's called a reg CF and then a sidecar, what's called a reg D. Mm -hmm. And in a reg D offering, it's a private placement memorandum. Again, Stephen's shop can help you set this up where you have a deal going on whichever platform you pick, we fund under Start Engine Republic or any of the other 60 deals, but you have a reg D that enables you because in your reg CF bus, you can only have $5 million. However, in your reg D, you have unlimited because it's coming from either a very wealthy person or an institution. And so this is a unique situation that crowdfunding, it helps attract that initial audience, that initial crowd, which will then help attract those larger investments. And that's part of your strategy when you work with your legal counsel to, to structure your deal so that you can accept whatever funds come your way. Right. So this, yeah, this funding that we're, that uh, we're getting from this uh, shark, um, they, <clears throat> we, we are only letting them do the reg D and not go through the portal because it's such a large amount of money because it's been pretty expensive and time consuming to go outside of WeFunder. So we, so with people who were asking us when they were going to invest 25,000, can I do it outside? We've said no, um, because it's easier for us to go through WeFunder. It's definitely required a lot of effort to, to do the uh, Reg D. So it turns out that being a filmmaker requires not just the creative uh, uh, experience, but also the entrepreneur's vision and, and effort. So uh, with that in mind, what about the, 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 the marketing hat uh, as, as part of the mix of, of skills that an issuer or producer really needs to have? We talked earlier how it was important to market the, the project to your fan base and to your audience. But isn't it also important, Samson, um, and Meryl to uh, to market the film um, months before you know throughout the process of so that when the film is released that th that you have that audience that that's keyed up already that's already familiar with the film and eager to to see it in on screen or stream or wherever. Mm -hmm. Meryl, you, but you all means first. You go first. Um, yeah, I would say definitely because you're not going to, you know, we don't know at this point, like what kind of distribution deal we're going to get and how much whoever, you know, hopefully buys us will be putting into that. So it's good that we have built this audience. So whatever they do, we also have our own team. Um, and Meryl, isn't it possible that that distributors looking at your film will be able to see the kind of following that you have in your social media and all the money that you raised? from your, your campaign, your crowdfunding campaign as a validation of, of, of what you're doing and that there is an existing audience there. They don't have to, to start from scratch and, and, and build it upon, upon, upon the acquisition. They've, it's sort of a momentum. It doesn't that signal to, isn't that a good thing to signal to distributors 
that you already have a fan base. Definitely. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Jim Cummings. Um, he he just did uh, something called Beta Test, which was a WeFunder funded uh, movie. And he has he had an amazing uh, he's on Twitter all the time and he's really talking and he's everywhere. And I think that that really helped push him through. Hopefully I can do just as well. <laughs> uh, I think I think you will. And I just want to provide three points that I'm that popped into my head. Um, one, you can't get discovered in the audience. I tell this to people all the time, you can't get discovered in the audience, but that's part of where if you're using crowdfunding to promote, to raise money for your film and you're growing that crowd, that audience, they're going to help you get discovered because the distributors, the people in the film industry, they're like, Hey, how much did they raise? That's great. We really were very interested because that, that movie comes with a built-in fan base, uh, which is very powerful. I think the people who've done this best is Legion M. Uh, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with them. So I feel like they're around since 2014 or 2016, they raise around 10 or $11 million total for their different films. Um, and they come with about 25,000 uh, investors, 25,000 uh, customers who are also their investors. So just keep in mind, you can't get discovered in the audience. So this is where crowdfunding helps you get on that stage and put the spotlight on your film itself. Uh, the other thing I like to tell people, again, it doesn't matter which industry you're in, but I like to tell them every dollar tells a story. And if you tell your story well, dollars will come listen to yours. So remember this as you go to market. You're already storytellers. You're doing it visually. Tell that story in a really compelling way, because at the end of the day, you either want, you either want investors, investors, or fans. Uh, either way, you're going to be able to book cash from them. The difference is from an investor, you book that cash as an investment. From a fan, someone who buys your ticket, uh, your t-shirt, et cetera, you book that cash as revenue. And this is where crowdfunding, again, it helps you get that ball rolling, helps you test your go-to-market strategy, helps you build that groundswell so that your, your film is more likely to be successful once launched. We actually had Legion M, the people from Legion M interviewed us uh, on our WeFunder. So we have a, a video of that. So yeah, they were great and very helpful and, and, you know, giving us a little validation. Awesome. No, it's a great, I feel like the, the film industry is a great community, particularly when someone from an independent film is successful. Other independent film makers are like, I can do that. I can be part of that movement. Um, so, Meryl, have you thought about uh, what would happen to the dropout in the event you don't find a suitable distribution partner? Um, well, then it's sort of self-distribution, um, you know, like getting on Amazon for a certain amount of money, um, iTunes, um, you know, a, a, we're planning on doing the festival route and our, we have an executive producer who has had a lot of successful uh, indie films. And he says that a lot of it happens before the festival that you can make a deal, but then if not, then you hopefully do it at the festival. And if that doesn't happen, then I guess the beauty of right now is that you, you can get on Amazon and just sell it yourself. Have you considered uh, the prospect of working with aggregators to hit some of those platforms? Um, we're not really there yet. I'm, I, I hopefully, hopefully our executive producer will help us with that, um, but we're sort of just thinking about cast. Okay. So you, I, I also noticed in your the presentation that, uh, that uh, you and your partner have a, quite a bit of experience. And do you feel like that experience was helpful in attracting uh, investment to your campaign, to your project? Yeah, I think definitely uh, her experience was was helpful. I've, I'm a writer, I'm, I just write. <laughs> uh, but she has a lot of uh, industry connections and has done a lot of many, many shorts um, and been to the film festivals and stuff like that. So she was already known, even though this is her first feature, she was already known as a filmmaker. So it was also a validator, giving people mm -hmm. comfort in in um, investing in your project. Yeah. 
Uh, and okay. Stephen, the, the other thing I'd like to point out for, you know, you're, if you're a filmmaker, you're an entrepreneur and entrepreneurship is hard. And the hardest part of anyone's overnight success is always that first 10 years while you're mm-hmm. waiting to get discovered. And so just remember, if things don't go as planned, communicate to your investors. Super important. You have a regulatory requirement. And investors tend to be like, oh, I enjoyed the journey. I understand I lost my $250, $500. Let me know when you're going to do it again. I'll sign them right back up. So there's that potential. So you always want to pivot forward. One of my favorite stories in film is Shawshank Redemption. I uh, sucked in the box office, cult following afterwards. Uh, and of course, the most recent Squid Games, it only mm-hmm. took a brief 10 years to get made. The budget was 21 million, but it's gone gangbusters. And so even if you're even if you're successful in the raise where you raise some amount of money to attract your investors, what we're looking at post-raise, that's just business operations and strategy. So you can be successful in your raise. Um, just remember, sometimes business being business, things might go awry. Keep your mental focus, pivot forward, update your investors, communicate with them often, keep them engaged because they'll be very forgiving if you're constantly engaged, but if you're not, they will have no forgiveness whatsoever. So that's excellent ad- advice, uh, communicating with investors. They, they, they're there for the good news, but they really want candor and transparency for all the news. So I really appreciate your saying that's very valuable information. Um, another valuable um, uh, area to discuss is the fact that uh, if you haven't done a uh, a crowdfunding campaign, whether it's rewards or equity, it it's so it, it's so helpful to have the benefit of a wilderness guide. And there are teams out there that you can uh, engage to help you who who have very successful uh, batting averages, who've been uh, who really understand what works, the dynamics, and um, and can help you be successful the first time out. Just like making films, you're going to make mistakes. There are a million decisions throughout the process. And uh, a campaign, a first-time campaign is going to make some mistakes too. But when you surround yourself with experienced people, with counsel that has been, that is, uh, that, that understands the issues, can issue spot, problem solve with you, make sure you're in a good situation so you don't have to, to scramble uh, in the event things don't work out. That's, that's really important. But surrounding yourself with, experienced producers, experienced experience marketers, experienced crowdfunding platforms. Those are, uh, that's invaluable. Do not uh, underestimate the amount of, of knowledge and e- expertise across the board in, um, in making a film and especially in uh, forging ahead with a successful crowdfunding campaign, whether it's for rewards or for equity. Um, Rivka, do we have any, uh, do we have time for questions? And if so, um, do we have any that are already um, uh, pending? If not, let's see what, uh, let's invite our, our guests to ask questions if, they, yes, if they'd like to. Yes, we do have time. And we have a question from Angel. What are some other incentives that you offer to investors? Um, so let's see, we, there's a signed script, there's a walk on a seat at the, uh, premiere, uh, oh, one that we haven't had anyone take advantage of so far was, um, was to get a script consultation, um, which, you know, we'll see if anybody is interested in that. Um, uh, what else, uh, social media, um, that is all I can remember right now. Very cool. And we have another question from Derek. Can you speak to the possibility of wrapping crowdfunding into IRA accounts, or do you know of any resources that we could tap into? So I think this is a question for me. Generally speaking, uh, depending on which crowdfunding portal you select, again, there's over 60, they have it so that you can use your initial uh, individual retirement accounts to make investments. So that's just, it's it's part of the payment feature. Some people use their debit card. Some people use ACH. Some people use their IRA. You just have to make sure that the crowdfunding portal that you're working with has that feature built in. So it, it does already exist again, but there's over you know uh, four dozen different crowdfunding campaign 
crowdfunding portals. You just need to make sure that feature is already in your portal or on your portal. And I have a question for Meryl. Were there any, um, was there any sort of like, I guess crowdfunding literacy you felt you had to do for your audience or that you would suggest is helpful in terms of getting people who might be hesitant to towards getting on? Well, you know, they might be, maybe this is more friends and family who are like, I want to support you, but I'm intimidated by this platform. Is there anything you found useful in that conversation? Yeah, uh, you don't know how many texts I had that said, why do I have to put my social security number? Can I not put my social security number? Please, please don't make me put my social security number. My husband hates me because I gave you my social security number. And I basically had to tell them, like, we have, I'm sorry, it's not for me. It's because it's an investment, not a donation. Um, and some people wouldn't do it. Some people just sent money. Um so explaining why that's necessary, because people, the friends and family don't necessarily understand that they're investing. They still think it's like a Kickstarter, um, no matter how many times you explain it. Um, so yeah, that was a big one. You're, you're going to spend a lot of time doing investor education. Um, and I tell people, it's just like E-Trade, Fidelity, or Prudential. The reason they need your demographic information, I'm sorry, your social uh, is so that they know it goes back to the KYC AML and you want to make sure that the right person gets the equity or the debt or whatever that it's assigned to the right person. Uh, and I see that Dan asked a really good question. Can an issuer do several raises? I forgot to tell you this, that you can raise up to using Reg CF, you can raise up to $5 million every 12 months. So what that means is if it's November now and your raise closes uh, in 2022, uh, in December, you can raise another $5 million. There is something called Reg A plus or Reg A and then Reg A plus. Again, uh, you can retain your lawyer. They'll tell you the difference about difference between Reg A and Reg A plus uh, where you can raise up to $75 million. And so that's another form of crowdfunding. Most people in order to get their business rolling, to get their idea or project rolling, they don't need to raise 75 million. They don't need to raise five. They need to raise around 255,000. So just keep that in mind. Don't feel pressured to like, oh, we have to raise 75, $50 million. No, you don't. You can raise whatever you actually need. And that goes back to the breakdown of your use, how you're gonna use of funds. Last point is that you can you can only have one campaign going at a time. So. You can't put your, the same deal on multiple uh, platforms. One, the platforms won't allow it. Two, uh, you'll be in a love affair with the SEC. And three, they'll send the FBI to come pick you up to discuss the love affair you're about to be in with them. So you definitely don't want to do that. But you need not be concentrated on solely one project. You can finish a project within that 12-month period. Maybe it's a four-month campaign. And then you can start another campaign. Uh, for another project in within that same 12 month period, up to $5 million within a 12 month period. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you all so much. Oh, we have one. Oh, thank you, Barbara, for this question. Is there one site where you can compare all 60 platforms? Interesting. Um, you can go to King's Crowd, uh, King, K I N G S Crowd, King's Crowd. Uh, and so what that does is it shows you all of the campaigns that are presently up on all of the crowdfunding portals. So that, that way you can see like, oh, here's what they're doing uh, at any given point in time. So that's King's Crowd. Uh, and then there's another company called uh, Crowdfunding Capital Advisors. Uh, they issue more uh, crowdfunding capital advisors. They give a more holistic approach of what's happening across the industry. This is why when I'm quoting specific uh, numbers, I get that from them. So again, they'll show you They'll give you a contrast of who's doing what, because there is a platform called Fanvestor, uh, Fanvestor that specializes in music and movie. But some people use uh, WeFunder because probably because they were uh, the folks from Legion M. When Meryl was able to do an interview with them, WeFunder is focusing on the on the film industry, 
So you do have platforms who are dedicated to a specific vertical. And this is part of your due diligence when you go to select which of these dozen uh, funding portals uh, work for me. And by the way, when I say funding portal and platform, in this instance, they're synonymous. Awesome. Well, wonderful. Thank you all so much for your sharing your experience, your wisdom on this topic. And thank you as always, Stephen, your amazing moderator. For those of you listening, we have a lot of other, we have some webinars that Stephen's hosted on similar topics and we've had Samson on another one. So check out all of our content and thank you all. This will be recorded as a resource because I'm sure there's a lot of stuff you're gonna wanna go back to um, and jot down when all of you make your films and do your crowdfunding campaigns. Hey, thank you, Meryl. Thank you, Samson. And especially thank you to uh, to Florence Belsky Foundation, Flobel, for these amazing uh, programs. It's so, it's really exciting to share out this information. Um, so thank you again, everybody, and we'll see you at another seminar soon. Cheers. Yes, and please, thank you, thank you. And please follow Meryl and her film on social media. We'll follow up yeah. with all of you. Have a great evening. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.